Okay, so maybe we can start. So welcome to our uh, the, the seminar of the system engineering today. So we have the Professor Mustafa from University of Utah. And uh, Mustafa is an uh, associate professor in the Department of the Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Utah. His research focuses on the power system optimization, power system resiliency, interdependent infrastructure networks, energy economics, and the policy, and the energy justice. So Dr. Uh, uh, Mustafa holds a PhD degree in energy engineering from the Penn State University, as well as a, a, a bachelor and a master degree from Iran, the University of Taiwan. And uh, prior to uh, joining the University of Utah, he worked as a postdoc scholar at the Arizona State University. And uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Mustafa is a recipient of the 2022 NSF Career Award. So, welcome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for um, hosting me in your beautiful campus. Um, and you did the introduction. So I teach in the electrical engineering department at the University of Utah, uh, working on a bunch of projects related to the power grid. And, and the one that I'm talking about today uh, relates to grid operation during severe weather. And we want to see if there is anything that we can do um, in short-term operation when we know that we have a severe weather event coming. Um, so I'll talk about hurricanes mainly, but then I, I will end with a little bit um, of suggestions about ice storms, and then we'll, I'll, I'll finish there. But I'll, I'm happy to answer questions after that about other events if, if you're curious to talk about. And this uh, figure that I have um, on my first slide kind of captures the whole story that I want to tell. So we're developing a framework where we're taking a um, atmospheric science model where it gives us weather prediction, weather forecast, customized towards power systems operation. We take information from this model, feed it into a structural um, stability analysis model where we predict whether or, or not our components are going to withstand the forces of the severe weather that is coming. So if it's a hurricane and the important parameter is the wind force, are your transmission lines going to withstand the force of the wind? And once those predictions are made and we know which elements are likely to fail and which elements are likely to survive, then we feed those information into a power systems operation model and um, that will solve and then it will give you a dispatch that is likely more resilient, will reduce the power outages compared to the case where you didn't do any of this, right? So this is um, the whole story. Um, why am I going to talk for one hour about all of this? This is really computationally difficult and it faces a lot of challenges. So I will talk through some of those challenges and then see how we can develop a framework that actually works in practice. And I'll be mainly talking about stochastic optimization, and then I'll talk about some applications of machine learning to be able to really bring this framework to life and have it work um, in an actual system. All right, so let's talk briefly about um, the applications and where we use weather forecasts in power systems operation. So. Um, Weather forecast is used in power systems operation. Traditionally, we use it for load forecast, uh, and we actually have become really good at it. So we have models that take weather forecast data, mainly temperature and humidity, and then forecast for you how your load is going to change for the next day or next week or, or so. Um, so there, is, there are conferences that are dedicated to just this topic of load forecasting, right? And again, pretty mature tools that we have for it. Recently, the problem has become more interesting again because we're adding a lot of renewable energy to our system and these are weather dependent uh, supply sources, right? So if you have rooftop solar, now not only do I have to predict your load, but I also have to predict your production uh, on site because what I see as a utility is the net load that I have on my system and prediction of how much generation I'm getting out of rooftop solar or wind is not necessarily easy. 
So if, if the, a utility a system operator is interested in, in net load forecasting, now they have, again, a challenging problem to deal with. So um, an interesting topic in and of itself. But that's not really the focus of my work. My work is focused on extreme weather. So this is, um, say, a hurricane, a ice storm, a severe snowstorm, uh, events of that nature that we're, we're trying to focus on on this project. And we want to see what we can do with weather forecasts in those cases. So what the industry does is that the system operators do have access to weather forecasts in case of extreme weather events. Some of the system operators even have meteorologists on site that help them interpret the data and deal with the data. But the issue and the main challenge is that the, the forecast is not systematically integrated in the grid operation tools. And what the system operators do is that they make ad hoc judgment-based decisions when extreme weather events are happening. So they put all the operators in a room, kind of discuss what's going to happen, and then make some, some uh, judgment-based decisions. This is based on how the operators know their system and how the system behaves. Um, and of course, this is better than doing nothing, but um, in using judgment, you can miss um, better solutions, and you can still um, have to lose load where you could save the load if you had better software tools that could make optimal decisions for you. So um, again, that's what we want to do. We want to see if we can replace the judgment of the operators, these judgment-based decision-making with a software tool that um, is better in one way or the other. So let's look at the impact of extreme weather events. Um, so here I have an example of a hurricane, but most other extreme weather events are similar in terms of their impact. So you can partition your power systems in three different sectors, generation, transmission, and distribution, right? So generation is, is the power plants. Usually you have a power plants in a built environment, in a building, and because of that, the damage level is usually low. So these are uh, built in, in rather strong buildings, and you usually don't see um, severe damages to your generation, unless you're talking about an extreme case of a earthquake, something like that, right? Um, which is not, again, the focus of my talk because earthquakes are not predictable. I'm interested in things that are predictable and we can do something about them in the short term. Uh, the transmission and distribution system, on the other hand, are vulnerable to damages. So you get high level of damages in the transmission system, high level of damages in the distribution system. And the main cause of the damage in the case of a hurricane is the wind force. If you have flooding on top of that, then it becomes even worse, right? But um, other types of events, like an ice storm, also faces a similar type of a damage uh, profile where your transmission and distribution system get most of the damages. Um, so that's type of the impacts on, on the system from a physical perspective. There is another really important impact on the system, which is the impact on the load pattern. So you can imagine the day that you're having a hurricane in your system, the load pattern is not going to be similar to a normal day, like, right? So like if you're used to go uh, home in the evening and turn on your TV and you know, like start cooking and all of these things, it's likely that on a hurricane day, like your behavior is going to be a little different, so the load pattern will be different, right? Again, that is not what um, my model is going to consider. We're assuming that there are other tools where they can capture the impact of the change in the load that we are able to use. And we're mostly focusing on these type of physical damages that are happening in the system and try to resolve those or, or work around them. Um, rather than resolving them, there is really no way to resolve them. Okay. So now let's look at some data, and uh, this is the data that we get from the hurricane season of 2017. It was a pretty strong hurricane season, and we had three major hurricanes. So we had Hurricane Harvey in August uh, with a landfall in Texas, and 300,000 customers in Texas lost their power. We had Irma in September. Um, making a landfall in Florida, and then the major impacts were since in Florida and Georgia. 
six million customers uh, lost power in Florida, around 60% of the total um, customers, and then one million customers lost power in Georgia, around 20%. And then we had Maria in September, where 100% of the island of Puerto Rico um, lost power. Um, you, you can see the change in the net load in uh, two of these events, so I mean, there is no point in showing the Maria case, right? Like, you go from some load to nothing because the whole island went out. But for Harvey and Irma, where you partially lost your system, you can see how uh, you had a load pattern, and then when the hurricane made the landfall, it goes to a different trajectory because um, some percentage of the system loses power, and then gradually over the course of a, about a week for the case of Hurricane Harvey, uh, the system was recovered fully, so you go back to your original pattern. Uh, for Irma, it took a little bit longer because it was a, a more strong uh, system, a more strong event. So the research question is, is there anything we can do in short term? Short, so short term meaning that we don't have the option of hardening the system. The system is already there. You can't really improve it in uh, a week before the hurricane is coming. Is there anything we can do in short term operation with with the decisions we make in operation to reduce the number of power outages that we have to improve that system. And like many other engineering questions like this, the answer is yes, but it depends on what it is that you're after, what it depends on the trade-offs, and it depends on the event, right? So for example, in the case of Hurricane Maria, where you have like such a strong hurricane knocking down the entire system, well, maybe you can't really do anything, right? But for Smaller events like Harvey, like Irma, there is likely some um, gains that we can make through enhanced operation of the system, and we are really after improving these numbers, the outage numbers. And in doing so, we focus on the transmission system and not the distribution system, and I tell you why. So, in, in the distribution type of damages that you get, you have a radial network, meaning that it's like a tree if you want to think of it in terms of graphs. And as soon as you lose a branch of your tree, then downstream of that failure, you're going to lose power. There isn't really much that you can do. You can rearrange the system. Um, there is a little bit of possibility over there, but usually when a hurricane passes through an area, knocks down all the distribution lines, and you get so much damages that there isn't really anything that you can do about it. Uh, the transmission system on the other side is a mesh network, so even if you lose a transmission line, you still have paths to transfer power from point A to point B, so you do have that mesh structure that helps you. Also, looking at the event of Hurricane um, Irma in this case, uh, look when you have start having power outages. You, as soon as you have landfall, you have power outages in the north parts of the state of Florida, right? And that cannot be a, a distribution damage, right? The hurricane is far away from the northern parts of the state of Florida. Why do you have a power outage? It's because of the transmission system. So the failures that you see in the south can make their ways to the northern parts of the system because now your transmission system is weak. It's a mesh network, so whatever happens here can go to the other sides of the network, and, and that's exactly what we're, we're trying to fix. We're trying to see if there is a way that we can dispatch our system around the failures in a way that um, our, our dispatch is more resilient and the power outages are reduced. And we also should note that the damages to the transmission system are significant during um, these type of events. So in the case of Hurricane Harvey, we had 97 lines that failed uh, that had a voltage rating of over 139 kilovolts. So these are definitely considered transmission level lines, not distribution. And for Hurricane Sandy, we had 218 high voltage transmission lines that were uh, down. So significant level of damages. Uh, it can cascade to other parts of the network and there is an opportunity because of the meshed structure of the network that you can um, improve things. All right, so how do we do that? So the same figure that I showed you on my first slide, so we developed this framework where 
uh, we try to integrate weather forecasts in a systematic way in power systems operation software tools. So uh, we forecast the weather, customized for power systems operation, meaning that at the right altitude, at the right resolution that you need for your power system infrastructure, that goes into a structural stability analysis module where um, we have civil engineers working to develop uh, structural models of the transmission towers and lines and their interaction, and they uh, can then give you a failure probability for each and every element of your network uh, based on the timestamp of tomorrow. So they can tell you this line is likely to fail with a probability of 70% at 7 a.m. tomorrow morning. So something like that. that. That would be the output. And then that output goes into a power systems operation model where I develop, my team and I developed a stochastic unit commitment model where those probabilities are, are then integrated into an operational model to now find a dispatch that will reduce the loading of the lines that are likely to fail. So if they do fail, then we don't have as big of a problem because the loading of the lines were already low, right? So that's the intuition behind the model. So I will briefly talk about these two components, the weather forecast component and the structural component, and really not my area of expertise, so pardon me if uh, I don't sound too intelligent, but then I will focus more so on the power systems operation module, which is what my, my group actually worked on. So uh, are the increasing standards for equipment, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, has there been a change in the industry to, to actually strengthen stuff? There has been. So there are um, uh, climate models showing that, well, so, so the way that these, um, the, the transmission equipment are, are designed is based on historic level, like wind force and, and things like that. And there are regions in the country, so like areas on the coast usually have higher winds, so they need to have stronger structures, right? So there are climate models that show that uh, what we have used in terms of historical data is not going to be valid for the future. So standards are improving, definitely. But yeah. I mean, what you're implying is, is that Florida violates no standards, basically. For the so, so Right, so standards don't guarantee that you're never yeah, going yeah. to have a failure. So there are like, oh, you shouldn't have like 10 events like this every year, but like, is it okay to have like one event like this every 10 years? You know, standards are developed based on those, those assumptions. Um, also, like our infrastructure is pretty old. So even if you update the, the standard, then um, they don't necessarily imply that you have to go and replace all of the transmission lines that you had in the past. It applies usually to new developments. So mm -hmm. you still get things like this all the time. I, I can't hear you well. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. What time failure? Uh, the mean time mean failure. So yeah. This transmission, this transmitter, if it has a mean time failure of most manufacturers, probably 3 million uh, work uh, hours, mm -hmm. and then you fail, you probably work at 0.01, and then based on the age, then you can tell this component may fail because of this event that happened yeah. in the architecture. Community. Yeah, that's a great question. I don't think. They model like, the, so that goes to the age of the equipment, right? Like it's an older one, so it's more likely to fit. I don't think they modeled that. My, I don't, so what they did model was like the structure assuming that it complied with the standard. Right, yeah. And then they tested it on the wind force that they got from the actual data. Yeah, but that's a very good point. Okay, so, um, very quickly on, on the weather forecast module, so uh, we have this collaborator in atmospheric sciences that developed the model for us. We have a high resolution wind field. Um, we get the track and the movement speed estimation of the hurricane. 
we get ensemble forecasting, which is multiple tracks within the forecast, and then we get our forecast at different time scales. So, you, for example, you get a five day ahead forecast, a 48 hour ahead forecast, a day ahead forecast, and an hour ahead forecast ahead of the landfall. Um, so this is all the data that is available to the rest of the team to, to work with. Um, speaking of big data, I never realized uh, how big the data sets are in, in atmospheric sciences. They're the bigger user, biggest users of um, high performance computing. Um, some of the hurricane data, the raw data is like um, hundreds of terabytes, if you can believe it. Um, yeah, so that it's, it's it's challenging, and then we had to work with them to just extract the features of the data that we really need because we don't want to deal with 100 terabyte data. So the transmission failure estimation, um, so we have this structural drawing of the transmission towers. Um, by the way, like this is, uh, there is like no one standard transmission tower. You have very different uh, designs, Different voltage ratings will have different structures. They can be built of different materials. So this work is, is not very easy to do. So we go from that to a finite element modeling, and then um, my colleagues run structural stability analysis on their models. So you can have something that is very computationally demanding but very accurate, all the way to models that are relatively fast but not very accurate. And we, we use both of them. And um, my colleagues in civil engineering are still working on making these uh, models better. One of the students working on the project actually now works for a um, transmission tower uh, company. So we're able to make more contacts and get like actual designs and get feedback from the industry and make sure that our models are working well. The way we decide if a tower fails or not is based on the top drift of the tower, right? So. There is so far that the top of the tower can drift before it actually collapses. And there are thresholds, so we can use um, the thresholds based on the tower design and, and um, historical data and stuff like that, again, outside of my area of expertise. But all of this will then be translated into a fragility curve, where on the x-axis you have the wind speed, on the y-axis you have the failure probability. and. Um, this is like the fastest model that they can build. They can uh, develop a lot of data, and then again, this is like a proxy model that is relatively fast and relatively accurate, um, and can give you a probabilistic estimation of the line failure based on the wind speed that you get in, in a hurricane. So that's the output from the structural stability model, and that's what we then need to work on. So now, as the input to the power system operation model, I get all these probabilistic estimation of uh, line failures. And uh, I don't have one or two lines that could fail. Remember, like we had hundreds of lines in the event of Harvey or Hurricane Sandy. Uh, and those are the ones that we know after the fact failed. So if you wanted to do the probabilistic estimation, you would probably have two, three, four times that size where you said, well, this line may fail with a probability of 30%, the other one with a probability of 80%. Um, so you are dealing with a larger uncertainty set, and this is a combinatorial set, right? So you have to pick the combination of um, these uh, likely outages to be able to kind of like talk about the future and what are the likely outcomes in terms of actual physical outages. So we're dealing with a large uncertainty set. That's the message I wanted to, um, to talk about. And how do we manage that uncertainty? So we have a, a number of options when it comes to uncertainty management in grid operation. We have stochastic optimization, robust optimization, uh, engineering judgment, and we also can use deterministic rules. So stochastic optimization, robust optimization, these are established mathematical um, frameworks that we can use, of course, you should. a lot of you are familiar with. Engineering judgment is similar to what I described that the industry does today. So get together, um, kind of like talk through what is happening, and then 
the operators who know the system then will make decisions for you. Deterministic rules are proxy to stochastic optimization um, in the sense that instead of actually dealing with the uncertainty in a systematic way, you buy yourself room. Um, so that's how we handle with like um, n minus one outages, for example, these days. Like there is a possibility that something will fail in the system, so let's just make sure that we have a 10% extra capacity ready to go in the system in case something goes wrong. I have these resources that I can bring online and, and, and they will uh, solve my system. So similar to that, in terms of, a, in, in the case of a hurricane, you can say, well, instead of 10% reserve margin, I want to have like 40% reserve margin. So that will help you manage your event a little better. Or you can have other deterministic rules as well. So that's another way of um, addressing this problem. We went with the stochastic optimization because it seems like um, it's the more flexible framework to help us find the solution. Robust optimization kind of tries to uh, optimize the worst case scenario and that's not necessarily what we want to do here. Um, so we go with stochastic optimization. Okay, so what are the principles of the modeling framework that we use? So um, we want to now, instead of just solving for the operational decisions, um, assuming that we have a fixed system, we want to now incorporate those outage probabilities that we have for our transmission lines inside our um, optimization model. So that's one of the main differences. And the objective function remains to be cost minimization, so that's the objective of power systems operation. But this time, we add a significant penalty for um, shedding load. There is usually not an option. You still have to shed the load because hurricanes are strong events. You are going to have to lose some of the load in the system, but that is penalized heavily. And that penalty, what it does is that it kind of like pushes your solver from minimizing cost to trying to save as much of the load as possible. So that's, that becomes the main direction of the optimization problem. Hopefully what we're hoping is that the solution will have a reduced power outage compared to business as usual operation because we were able to explicitly model these failure probabilities. But there are a number of challenges in actually doing that um, and I'll talk about three of them here and actually the third one is the main one. So the first one is that multiple line outage modeling is difficult, right? Um, we can do pretty well if we only are losing one of our elements in the system. There are sensitivities that we have developed specifically for that. But once you have more than one transmission lines going out of the system, uh, it becomes difficult in terms of um, modeling adjustments that you have to do. The second challenge is uncertainty management. So again, we're dealing with a combinatorial set of uncertainty. It's really large, so how do you actually model that? Um, and all of this comes down to computational tractability. So uh, for your day ahead operation, for example, you have four, five, six hours of computational time to solve the problem and find the, the decisions. If it takes longer than that, then you're already getting to the operation. So you need to have the, the solution, right? And if you don't have the solution, if you have the best, the optimal solution, but it takes like two years to, to find it, then it's useless, right? So computational tractability is the forefront of um, the objectives. We want to make sure that we are able to solve the problem fast enough, even if we're losing some quality. Okay, so first challenge, multiple outage handling. So um, those of you who have worked on power system operation models know that there are different ways of calculating power flow on transmission lines. You can have a nonlinear AC model of power flow, of course, very computationally demanding, so nobody really uses that in optimization models. We have the B theta model um, of the flow. That is also computationally demanding, although it's linear. Uh, but what the industry actually uses is a shift factor, and shift factors are sensitivities um, that say, if I increase the 
production of power in this power plant by one megawatt, uh, how does the flow on all of my transmission lines change? So once you have those sensitivities, then it becomes really easy for you to calculate the flow on all of your lines. And also, you don't have to model all the lines. You can only model those lines that you care about or you think will be um, loaded near their limit. The issue is that these shift factors, these sensit sensitivities change if the topology of the system changes. And the topology does change when you have a hurricane because some of your lines are going to fail and go out of the system. So how do you handle that? Uh, for single line outages, we have um, this conventional model called line outage distribution factor. And um, that gives you the flow on the rest of the network once you have an outage of one line. That framework, again, is not valid if you have multiple line outages. But there is another method um, developed by Pablo Ruiz and his colleagues. It's called flow canceling transactions. And it kind of gives you a framework to, to model flow on a network where you have multiple line outages. It's computationally more demanding than line outage distribution factors and shift factors purely, but the computation is not too bad. So that's what we use to model our multiple line outages. And I don't want to get into too much details about this, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, great question. So we assume that whatever we have in terms of our load forecast captures the consumer behavior. So we just take a load forecasting model um, and solve it for that. We don't really deal with that issue. Yeah, but that does impact the flows. You're right. So if you want to read more about this framework of handling multiple line outages, there is a paper we published in 2020 in IEEE Access. It's going to be on, the, on my last slide as well, but that goes in, in details of how we dealt with um, multiple line outages. Okay. Um, the second issue, and the really problematic issue, is uncertainty management and scenario selection. Again, we're dealing with a combinatorial uncertainty set. Um, so you have a bunch of lines that may or may not fail. You only have the probabilistic estimation of the failures. Um, so just to show you how big this set can get, if you want to explicitly model all the combination of possibilities, let's say we only have 36 lines that are affected in the hurricane area for a 24-hour period. Um, with, and, and again, like 36 is not a large number. Like in the case of Hurricane Harvey, actually 116 lines failed. So much, much bigger than that. But even in this smaller example, the number of possible outcomes is larger than the number of atoms in Earth. Um, clearly, no computer will be able to handle such a large uncertainty set. So we have to sample this space. There is no way for us to um, be able to model all of the possibilities. And the way we do that is we develop this scenario selection model, and it's, we put every single element that is likely to fail on a two-dimensional scale. The x-axis is the failure possibility feature. So each line will have a failure possibility that changes over the time, but has a peak, right? At some hour in the day, the hurricane has the strongest wind force affecting that transmission line, producing the largest possibility of outage. We take that maximum, and that will be our failure possibility. There is also a... a um, dimension of importance. So not all the transmission lines are equally important in the system. There are lines that are more important. There are lines that are less important. We also measure the importance of the line through some static metrics, which is PTDF and LODF. We essentially are trying to see um, how important that line is. And, and because our measurement is, is a static um, and not dynamic, this isn't necessarily the best way of measuring the importance of the element, but it, it does the job. So we now have been able to put all the elements that are likely to fail on this two-dimensional space. Now you can identify a threshold in the failure possibility and a threshold in the importance 
And that will be one scenario. So the way that scenario works is well, actually, maybe the previous slide was easier to explain this. Okay. So let's say we are at this red dot, right? So this red dot will identify a scenario in the sense that any transmission line that is more important to the network that, than this threshold and has a higher likelihood of failure than this threshold will be modeled in our scenario as a certain failure. So that way it's one deterministic progression of failures. So as soon as the lines that are important than this threshold surpass the failure probability here, we assume that the line has failed and it will remain failed for the rest of the operation. And you can pick as many of these points as you want. I'll talk about um, how we identify the number of scenarios that we want to model, but we essentially go down to something like 9 to 11 scenarios. So from the, this really large number to like 9 and 11, like it's, it's a really big, big progress. I'm going to skip this slide. Um, or maybe we can talk about two things. Okay, so um, two important points on this scenario selection method. One is here. So if, if you just model this scenario, let's see, let's see what this means. So this says that I only consider um, lines as failed if they have the highest level of importance to my system and they are certainly going to fail, right? So this is going to be um, kind of like a business as usual, assuming that no line will fail because this is like so high of a threshold that there is no, no way to meet, meet it. So you can run a business as usual unit commitment assuming that everything will survive. You also have this other extreme point, the red, and that says any line with any importance, as long as it has the slightest chance of failing, I'm assuming that they're going to fail, right? So this is kind of like a worst case scenario type of assumption. Um, and that's another extreme scenario that you can decide to choose. Kind of like robust optimization, right? Like trying to optimize your decision for a worst case scenario. With the caveat that like, this is not necessarily your wor worst scenario because the network is meshed. Sometimes like more failure is not necessarily worse, but more or less this is kind of like a robust uh, optimization scenario. So let's move on. So now I want to show some of the results that we have for the case of the Hurricane Harvey um, and see how we did. So we uh, have on the y-axis power outages in the Hurricane Harvey um, measured in megawatt hours. And then we have a number of cases on the x-axis that you can see, and I'll go through each and every one of them. Uh, because our event is a stochastic and you can only predict things with probabilities, you can't measure the power outages deterministically, right? So you will have a distribution of power outages based on what actually is going to happen. For our simulation purposes, we used a synthetic 2000 bus system um, developed by Texas A&M which is um, representing the complexities of an actual system without having um, sensitive data in it. Um, and the first case is a business as usual. So this is assuming that there is not going to be any failure. I'm just going to run my system the way I ran my system yesterday, the day before. And of course, this will give you a bad outcome, right? Because you are going to have a lot of failures in the system. So blue is the minimum expected power outage over 20,000 megawatt hours. Red is the maximum over 100,000 megawatt hours. And the average that we got is um, just above 60,000 megawatt um, hours of failure in, in the Texas system. And we, we, we get these distributions based on a large number of uh, Monte Carlo simulations on the possible um, outages. Okay. So, we, we ran these kind of like to get a baseline for our, um, the rest of our analysis, which is using the stochastic preventive operation framework that we have developed. But then we felt like this is not really fair to the system operators to say like they don't do anything, they do something, right? 
So to model that, then we said like, let's give the system operators all the flexibility that they have, and that is, let's bring all the generation that they have online so they have the maximum uh, reserve margin uh, to play with when actually the, the damage has happened. And we go from this really large power outage to something much smaller. So essentially using an engineering judgment works and it will improve your case, but we can do better than that. So from there, we run three different um, scenarios from the framework that we have developed. The first one is we just run a unit commitment, a deterministic unit commitment on the worst possible case. So the worst possible case is, um, is this red scenario here. So we assume that anything that could fail is going to fail, and it's still not stochastic. So computationally, it's not too hard to solve this problem because you really don't have any probabilities in it anymore, right? And that is better than the engineering judgment. Then we ran our stochastic optimization with two possible scenarios, the, the worst case and the best case. So combining this with this. And that improved. And then we further down, um, we further ran it with like 13 scenarios and it improved a little further. But somewhere around like nine to 13, you get saturated. So like you can't really improve your operation uh, much beyond that. Uh, point, at least not with our scenario selection model. So we don't really claim that our scenario selection model is the best that is out there. We have made comparisons with standard scenario selection models. It does better, uh, but maybe there are better scenario selection models out there. So to see these benefits, oh, to see these benefits a little better, I, I removed the first set of simulations. Let me go back here. So the, I, I removed this first set of results because these are like much larger. I just want to focus on the rest of them to see how different they are. And you're only looking at the average outages and you can see how you go from 25,000 megawatt hours with engineering judgment of bringing everything online down to above 5,000 megawatt hours to below 5,000 megawatt hours for the stochastic framework that we have developed. So that's one benefit. So you can actually improve the power outages by using um, this type of framework that integrates weather forecast data. The other important thing is engineering judgment is expensive. So if you bring everything online, your operation, and this is excluding the penalties that you pay for power outage, is $26.8 million for that day. But going to our framework, you can reduce it to $21 million. So it's actually cheaper to operate it using a smart framework like what we have um, developed. All right. So next, I want to quickly talk about how we can use machine learning um, to improve the framework. So the main challenge that we have is the computational burden of this stochastic framework because it takes a long time. So we're trying to see if we can make any improvements. So either bring down the time or improve the quality. And these two go hand in hand because if you have more time, then you can add more scenarios, more computation, and, and improve your solution as well. So the training data naturally, in our case, comes from earlier forecasts of the same event. So if you have a five-day ahead forecast for the hurricane, you can use that to train your model and then use it for the day ahead, hour ahead operation. So um, that's what we can do. So the second question that comes to mind is, what is there to learn? What can you learn? So we have two candidates for learning, and one is let's go and try to, to learn the solution, um, which is the unit commitment, which is the power outage of the, the power plants. Is that something that we can learn? And the, the second question, well, the, the second candidate is, is there anything we can learn about the structure of the problem? And in our case, the binding constraints of the optimization problem, so the congested lines, um, so we tried both of the methods, and I will tell you what happened. But essentially, our analysis showed that you can learn the solution, but you're going to make some mistake. There will be some error in the output of the, the learning algorithm compared to the actual uh, solution of the optimization problem that you're running. And even they may be close, um, the solver is very sensitive to mistakes in, in learning the solution. So 
if you let, make some mistakes in the solution, you may end up actually spending more time trying to get to your solution than just running a cold start. The second candidate, learning the congested lines, provided a lot of benefits. You can reduce your computational time significantly, and the model is not at all sensitive to, to errors in there, because if you do make an error, add a, a line that was not binding to your constraints, not a big deal. Um, it's just another constraint that is not binding. If you miss a constraint that is binding, then um, you just go through another iteration and add it and then resolve it. And because your constraint set is very small, then it still saves you a lot of time. So um, these are our sensitivity analysis with respect to errors and the computational time. So learning the solution itself, and you have the solution time, so the original stochastic unit commitment, then if you use machine learning and you make zero mistakes, then you have reduced the solution time by a little bit. But as soon as you start adding some errors to your learning algorithm, the solution time goes up and it actually is larger than the original solution time very quickly. So this is not a great thing to do. But learning the congested lines, if you can predict them with 0% error, you can reduce it very, very significantly. But if you, you make mistakes, and you make large mistakes, like 10, 25%, still you get a lot of time savings. Um, and you can tolerate mistakes. So that's, that's a great thing about it. So these are the results that we ran on a South Carolina 500 bus system. You have the solution time on the y-axis. You have the number of lines that go out in the case of a hurricane. The, the number of lines are not large because this is a relatively small system, 500 buses. And uh, we have the original stochastic unit commitment computational time on the top um, with its uncertainty band. And then we use machine learning to do what I just told you. And then we see the computational time on the bottom. And you see like something around 90% computational time reduction just by using uh, this this what we call machine learning assisted stochastic unit commitment. So, yeah, not too bad. Now I want to like switch gears and quickly talk about ISIS storms because, and I want to tell you that it's the same framework. So, um, you don't have to only um, consider hurricanes. This framework can handle other type of weather events that can be predicted. ISIS storms are another example of these events. So what happens during an ice storm, and this is a photo from the Quebec ice storm in 1998. Um, so you start seeing ice formation around the conductor, and that is heavy, and the towers are not designed to handle that weight. And if it's too heavy and you have a wind, then there are chances that you end up in a situation like this, and the tower is down, and you, you lose it. So you can run the exact same framework that I just told you. Um, predict the ice formation, predict the failure probabilities, run the exact same thing, with one exception. In the case of an ice storm, you have more tools in your toolbox. And, and the tool that you have is that you have losses on a, on, on a conductor. And you, if you have enough losses on a conductor, this is heat, right? You can either melt the ice or prevent it from formation in the first place. And that is even better, right? Like in a hurricane, you can't really do anything about the wind force, but here you can prevent the ice formation. So that's what we try to do. So you can essentially put a lower limit on the flow of the line, saying that I want the flow of this line to be above this threshold so that I generate enough heat so that I know that the temperature of my conductor is above zero degrees Celsius. So we ran this on a... Um, IEEE RTS 73 bus system that you can see here. What we did was that we created 24 cases, each case with 12 lines in the storm region. So there is a possibility of 12 lines, not a possibility, 12 lines have a temperature below zero degrees. So if you don't do anything, uh, you're going to have 12 lines that will have ice and you could possibly lose them. And these are all the lines that are in, 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 in those cases. And then we ran, a sim ran our simulation. So we have a traditional unit commitment, which again assumes that we are not integrating any of this information in our daily operation. We just operate the system uh, business as usual. 
And then we have an anti-icing unit commitment where we do incorporate these um, estimation predictions in our modeling framework and we try to maintain the temperature, the surface temperature of the conductors above zero degrees Celsius to make sure that there is no ice forming. So what you're looking here is a histogram. Um, the x-axis is the number of um, lines that have a sub surface temperature above zero degree. And um, the y is the number of cases. Okay, so how to read this? So, for ex so yellow again is the traditional unit commitment. So the numbers should add to 24 because we have 24 cases. So 2 plus 2, 4, 14, 19, uh, 22, 24. So we have 24 cases in here. Um, we have two of those cases where only one line maintained a surface temperature of above zero degrees, right? Um, because naturally the flow of those two lines were, were enough to create enough loss to maintain a temperature above zero degrees. Um, two cases with two lines above zero degrees, and then you can see the histogram. So even for the best case, only six lines were able to maintain a temperature of above um, zero degrees, and six other lines would get iced over, and these are potential lines that can collapse. With our anti-icing unit commitment, out of the 24 cases, we are able to maintain a temperature of above zero degrees Celsius for 16 of those cases for all the 12 lines. And then the rest of the cases, you can see the shift to the right, meaning that more lines have a surface temperature of above zero degrees. So even if something collapses, you have a much smaller problem to deal with. And this is a problem of operation, so you lose less power but also it's a problem of maintenance, so a line that collapses is very expensive to repair. And that is the last slide that I had. So just to conclude, so predictable weather-related natural hazards are the single largest cause of power outages in the United States, um, above anything else, above cybersecurity, above terrorist attacks, above anything else that people are concerned about, weather. Um, we know that weather forecast data can be used to, to, uh, to estimate component damage. Um, there is something you can do with the data. This is predictable. This is not like um, a cybersecurity attack that is not predictable. It just happens. Um, we can then incorporate component damage estimations in our power systems operation models to get what we call a preventive operation. An appropriate integration of this data and a preventive operation will help us reduce power outages and improve system resiliency and reliability in face of weather-related events. And all the climate models show that the, the intensity of these events are uh, increasing and their frequency is increasing also. Um, I also showed you how we can use machine learning to effectively enhance the computational tractability and model quality um, for the stochastic preventive operation framework that we developed. Um, seems like if you want to use machine learning, estimating the congested lines is one of the good options that you have. Um, it's not very sensitive to errors that the machine learning algorithm can make, and it also provides significant improvements in, uh, in the compu computational time. And naturally, in any weather-related event, you have forecasts that, that um, have a wide uncertainty margin, but you have them early, so you can use those for training your machine learning model. So naturally, there is data that is available for you to be able to train your model and use it for actual operation. Um, quick thank you to uh, my collaborators in atmospheric sciences and civil engineering. So Gabby, uh, my close colleague, is now in Florida. So she teaches in their civil and coastal engineering uh, department, a great place to do hurricane work. Um, I used to look like this before um, I became a professor. So those of you who are interested in academic jobs, be aware. Um, and these are some of the papers that we have published out of this work. 
um, that I talked about today. So, if you're interested in further reading them. And with that, thank you for paying attention. I'm happy to take this. So you mean a lookup table for like a generic hurricane? Generic, if you got caught, yeah. down, you can. Um, one challenge is that um, your operation could be very different based on the day. So, I mean, hurricane season is relatively limited to a few months. But um, like a, a day, a, a weekend day versus a weekday, a high load case versus a load, um, load case, you can potentially run all of these offline if you have enough computational uh, power and time and then develop something of that nature. Um, I don't see why you can't do that, but it would be a very large data set because of all of these variations. So the variation is not only in the weather event, but it's also in the, um, in the grid data, in the load and other things. Yeah. I was wondering more about the sort of engineering intuition based benchmarks. Uh, did you try any benchmarks besides just everything committed that might be more realistic, like committing the ones that have a high ranking of importance on like that y-axis, or committing something that represents what the operators actually did in the past hurricane? Yeah. Um, again, great question, and we didn't. Um, so we thought bringing everything online gives the operator the best kind of like scenario in terms of the flexibility that they have to manage the, the event, right? Mm -hmm. um, it also matches what we could gather from historical data. So there isn't a lot of data on what actually the, the operators did because in these type of events, they don't do a great job of logging um, the way they make decisions and, and even like in terms of damages and repairs and stuff like that, data is, is, is pretty bad. Um, yeah, that's why we did. So, so in, in, in one example, in Hurricane uh, Sandy, that's what I was trying to say. Um, at least in parts close to New York City, that was actually what the operators did. So they brought everything online. Is it a great assumption for the state of Texas that everything is online? Probably not. They probably just bring online um, fleet of generators that they have closer to the hurricane region but we didn't do anything besides bringing everything online. We just wanted to see, like, even if they did that, would our model be able to, to beat um, their solution? Yeah. Yes. I'm wondering how do you measure the effectiveness of the scenario you submitted? Because mm -hmm. in the diagram, it seems like um, and the, your selected certain scenario and the worst case scenario have reduced the cost and uh, very low uh, power outage compared with the benchmark. Yeah. So, how the effectiveness so we uh, exclusively focused on the reduction in power outages. We didn't care too much about the cost. We didn't care about the cost at all. Um, so the way we uh, evaluated the effect effectiveness was we obtained the solution from whatever like stochastic optimization or deterministic optimization model that we're using. So you have your your decision. Then within those decisions that you have, you have some reserve margin so you can move up and down uh, depending on what ha actually happens in real time. So we use our, our solution in a Monte Carlo simulation framework when we ran a large number of um, scenarios to see what the actual outage is. So for each this set of decisions, you can then generate all the possibilities of the failures, run Monte Carlo, and now the operator can move the dispatch up and down based on what is available to them, right? So then your Monte Carlo will saturate at some point. So there is no more changes. And at that point, I think for us was like 20 some thousand possibilities. At that point, you can kind of say, well, this is really what I'm getting in terms of 
um, the possibilities for this hurricane event, and then you can compare the probability, the probability distribution of the outage for any set of decision that you have. So we compare then like a, a business as usual unit commitment to a stochastic unit commitment to a worst case scenario unit commitment. You can see the whole probability distribution and how it shifts. Yeah. In the chat, if you would like to take a peek. Oh yes, of course. So the, the question is, was the feasibility of the power flow problem se severely affected by the inclusion of these probabilities of equipment failures? Did you have scenarios where the power flow was infeasible? Um, so um, yes, it, it is affected severely because you have all these outages. So like you have tens of line outages and it does change the power flow quite uh, dramatically. We do not have infeasibilities because um, we change the dispatch so that we don't get infeasibility, right? Um, we also allow over generation, which is another way of making sure that you don't have infeasibility. So if you have an infeasible flow, instead of like counting that as an infeasible flow, we say like we have over generation on, on this bus. Um, and then, did you have scenarios where the power flow, okay, so I, answer that. Is there a reason why the cost of operation of the worst case, best case, and the proposed designs have the same cost on slide 16? So this is uh, where I say the cost of operation in our models are all $21.3 million. So they're not exactly the same. Um, you can look at the cost um, with more digits and they are different. Um, but they all get very close to one solution. That's why um, for as much as we care, they almost have the same cost. Yes? Could you, could you say a little bit more about what a system operator would actually do? So, you know, we have a hurricane going to hit 3 o'clock this afternoon. I sort of anticipate bad things happening. Do I shed load? You know, can you? Yeah. So what our project suggests is that if they go about systematically integrating that forecast into their operation, so they will have to shed load anyway, right? But they can be smart about it, and hopefully that means that they have to shed less load than they would otherwise. I mean, you're, you're essentially downgrading vulnerable pieces of your network. Exactly. Sort of logical. Yes. And you're doing that in advance. Yes. And, and you go around your vulnerabilities, like you may uh, put a lot of power on this transmission line usually, but now that you know this line is vulnerable, you bring more expensive generation in other parts of your network so to reduce the loading of this line. So even when it, it fails, you're not going to have as much of a problem as you would have otherwise. And, and have any system operators embraced this? Um, ICE in New England is working on it. Um, the, the icing one seems to make more sense because even though you use can, can reduce the amount of load loss, let's say, the damage is probably going to be the same. Yes, yes, exactly, yeah. And ice storms, you're right, like that makes more sense because it saves more in their repair costs. Other questions? Thank you. Okay, so if we don't have any further questions, so I thank Professor Mustafa for the presentations. Thank you and so thank much. You us. This is my email. If you are interested in any of the papers, questions, discussions, I would love to chat.